Welcome back to class. We've looked at the Gospel of Matthew and taken a broad view of the events in the life of Christ up until the last week of his life. And we've looked at an overview of Mark and Luke and what makes each of them distinctive. And now we're going to look at the content of Mark and Luke. Particularly, we're going to look at the sections of Mark and Luke that are unique to each of those Gospels, meaning the parts of Mark that are not in the other uh, three Gospels, the parts of Luke that are not in the other three Gospels. Starting with Mark, as you'll remember, Mark is the shortest of the four Gospels, and most of Mark is repeated in either Matthew or Luke. So we start out looking at just some details that are unique in Mark. They are some of the same stories that are in the other Gospels, but we have some uh, finer details from Mark that uh, are not included in Matthew or Luke. For example, in the temptation of Jesus, it's the same story that you read in the other synoptic Gospels, but we have this little detail that when he was in the wilderness, you'll remember that's the uh, the eastern downside of the hills that include where Jerusalem is, and it's a very deserted, barren area, but there are wild animals there. We pick up the detail in Mark that Jesus was with the wild animals while he was in the uh, wilderness being tempted by the devil. Moving on to the second chapter of Mark, we pick up a few more details of a time when the uh, opponents of Jesus have charged him with violating the Sabbath. And the story is the same that you read in Matthew or Luke, but we have this detail only in Mark. And that is that one of the things Jesus said in answering these charges about doing things on the Sabbath that are uh, against tradition. He said, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. A memorable phrase, but it occurs only in Mark. All the Gospels tell about the sending out of the Twelve, the Apostles. And when we first read about them in Matthew and Luke, we learn that they were sent out with the power to heal. Well, Mark includes the detail that at that time when they were sent out to heal, that they were also sent out to preach. And we find the uh, little detail in the list of the apostles that Jesus had nicknamed James and John the Sons of Thunder. You'll remember that's one of the Aramaic translations that he provides for those of us and those uh, in the Roman Empire who didn't speak Aramaic. He named them Sons of Thunder. That just shows up in Mark. A very little detail, but a very interesting one, is that when Jesus was in the boat with his disciples out on the Sea of Galilee and a great storm came up and they were disturbed, it said that Jesus was asleep. But Mark adds the detail that he was asleep on the cushion. And it is only in Mark that we read that when he rebukes the wind and speaks to the sea to still the storm, only in Mark do we read that phrase that's so memorable in a hymn, Peace, be still. Mark is not the only one who tells the miracle of healing a hemorrhaging woman. You'll remember that he was traveling and this woman wanted his help and believed that if she touched the hem of his garment, she would be healed, which was true. But only in Mark do we find that Jesus perceived that power had gone out of him when the woman touched his garment. Another healing for a woman, this one particularly significant because it has to do with a non-Jew, a woman from uh, the area of Tyre and Sidon. The account, the, the miracle is not unique to Mark, but these details are. We do read elsewhere that he went to the Tyre and Sidon area, that's coastal um, northwest of Palestine area and Gentile. But we we read that uh, not only was he trying to get away from the crowds by leaving the um, 
Jewish area of Galilee where he lived and going to Tyre and Sidon, but he even uh, had a house to stay in there and he was trying to hide from the crowds. Well, of course, it didn't work. And there is a woman who is pleading for a miracle and we're told that she was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician woman. Elsewhere, she's referred to as a Canaanite woman, which means the old name for the land of Palestine, which was the land of Canaan. And we're told more specifically in Mark that she was of Syrian. That's what the Syro means. She uh, was of Syrian nationality and of Phoenician background. Phoenicia being um, some sea people who long, long, long ago had settled on that same sea coast. So she has some connection to the nation of Syria, the Roman province of Syria, and some ancestry with the Phoenicians who had moved to that area. Most people who know anything about Jesus are familiar with the time, with the times that he blessed little children. And the other gospels, uh, as Mark does, tell us that people wanted to bring their children up for Jesus to bless them. But the disciples were putting them off and, and telling them that, uh, you know, to, to go away, that, that they considered them a bother. Well, the detail that Mark provides for us is how Jesus felt about that. It says that Jesus was indignant when disciples rebuked people because they brought their children to Jesus. Jesus was indignant towards his disciples. The Gospels all tell us about when uh, Jesus identifies what are the greatest commands. Sometimes he's asking other people. Sometimes other people are asking him. Well, on one of those occasions, when a, um, a crowd is around and Jesus is answering the question, what are the greatest commands? And of course, you know, the greatest commands are first to love God and second to love your neighbor. After Jesus answers using the familiar, uh, universally understood uh, passages that all Jews considered to be the greatest, that is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. When Jesus answers that way and adds that you should love your neighbor as yourself, we're told only by Mark that one of the scribes, and the scribes tended to be people who opposed Jesus, one of the scribes actually commends Jesus for giving the right answer. And towards the end of the Gospel of Mark, uh, as we read elsewhere in the Gospels, there are women who are the first to arrive at the empty tomb. But Mark says that at first, anyway, they were trembling with astonishment. They were afraid. And so they didn't say anything to anyone. The other gospels, of course, tell us how they go on and they spread the news. Well, that is also involving something we looked at in the other lesson. And that is whether or not the gospel of Mark ends at verse eight. There is more in the gospel uh, there are more verses in chapter 16, but many scholars say that that must have been something that had been preserved separately from Mark that somehow got stuck on to the end of Mark. Well, it is odd as you're trying to decide is verse eight the end. If all you hear is that they were too afraid to tell anybody that the tomb was empty because that just doesn't line up with the gospel story as it's presented overall. There are a couple of teachings, uh, a teaching and uh, an event where there are extended details. One uh, healing account, there are extended details in Mark, and there is one parable that occurs only in Mark. In uh, chapter 9, we have the event. Chapter 9, verses 21 through 29. Jesus heals a boy with epilepsy. But only in Mark do we hear some of the conversation 
between Jesus and the boy's father. So Mark tells us that Jesus asks, how long has he been like this? And that the father replies that he's been this way since childhood. And then he moves on to say, help us if you can. Interestingly, Mark tells us that Jesus replies to that by saying, if you can, and then says, all things are possible for the one who believes. And then that beautiful statement of the father that we find only through Mark, he says, I believe, help my unbelief. And so we're told uh, what Jesus says to the demon that's causing this epilepsy in Mark. Uh, we're told elsewhere, of course, that Jesus commanded the demon and, and he left him. But we're told that the words that Jesus said at the time, according to Mark, were, you mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. We also have one other detail, and that is the initial recovery of the boy. It was a quick, uh, Matthew says, immediate healing. But people did notice that in that transition from when he was demon possessed so that he was epileptic and when he was completely healed, there was a moment that the boy was like a corpse and everybody was saying, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. So we have this other detail that in the process of casting out the demon, people were ready to jump to the conclusion that this boy laying still there uh, was dead. And then Jesus actually impresses them even more by taking him by the hand so that he can stand up. Backing up to chapter four, we have one parable in Mark that is not in the other gospels. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all have a section of parables. Uh, in the parallel sections in Matthew and Luke, uh, there are a number of parables that Mark also uses. But there is this one parable of seed and harvest that only shows up in the Gospel of Mark. Here, the parable is that God's kingdom is like scattering seed. You just go on about your business, uh, going to bed at night, getting up in the morning, day after day, and that seed that you scattered grows. It says, uh, and he knows not how. That is, you scattered some seed, you kind of forget about it for a while, you don't know how it grows. But then when the harvest comes, you've seen that growth, and you go and you harvest your crop. That one only in Mark. Now, there are some events that it's not just the details appear only in Mark, but the events themselves only occur in Mark or only recorded in Mark. There was a time, if, if you put it in its full context, that is verses um, 7 through 12 of chapter 3, when again Jesus is feeling inhibited from his preaching by the huge crowds that are seeking miracles. And we're told that he withdraws from the crowds. That's in about verses seven through 12. But included within that is the appointment of the apostles. And so it goes all the way down through verse 19. And then we're told that after appointing the apostles, when Jesus returned home, that would be to Capernaum, that they faced such big crowds that they couldn't even get away and get something to eat. Now, there are uh, different translations here. And so I'm going to give it to you more than one way. What it says that is unique to Mark is that his people took Jesus because somebody, they, said Jesus was out of his mind. Most translations put it that way, that his family took charge of Jesus because people were saying that Jesus was out of his mind. I read a very interesting article recently, though, that suggested an alternative uh, translation interpretation. 
First of all, the phrase his family is an interpretation. It just says those who were his, his people. Now, in the context of, of that section from verses 7 down through 19, it's likely that it's talking about his family, but it could have been his disciples. And it says that they seized him, that is, they laid hands on him, that is, they took charge of him. But then the question that uh, there's much disagreement about is, who said that Jesus was in an altered state? It could be that his own people concluded that he was crazy. It seems more likely that the crowds were saying that Jesus was, and the word is a broad one. That's why I say in an altered state. One translation is, and it appears elsewhere in scripture, is that it's someone who is out of his mind. But the article I read pointed out that that is not at all the only way that the phrase is used. Uh, it is also an expression of people being astonished at something. And although the wording is awkward, it could be that the crowds were saying that Jesus was like an altered state. He was, they were astonished. He was something very, very different. And so then this article was saying that in this context, perhaps the whole point is that Jesus had to withdraw from the crowds because people were so amazed at his miracles that they wouldn't listen to his preaching. And so he had to withdraw and that he even had to have his people, maybe his family, pull him aside and, and, and protect him from the crowds because so many people saw him as unusual, uh, something to himself beside himself sometimes translated out of his mind, usually translated out of his mind. But it may not be a negative about Jesus at all. It's just he was so different to the crowds that he attracted crowds. And his people, probably his family, maybe his disciples, wanted to protect him and took him away from those crowds. We have a miracle story, actually a couple of them, that are recorded only in Mark. There's a time when he is in Decapolis. You'll remember that when we looked at maps of how the Roman Empire and the Herodian family divided up the territory, there was one area that was not controlled by the Herod family called Decapolis, and it was 10 independent Greek cities, mostly to the east of the Jordan River with one of them spilling over to the other side. And it was not at all Jewish. No doubt there were Jews who lived there, but they were Greek, Gentile cities. And it is there that we see Jesus doing a miracle for a deaf and mute man. And we don't read about this miracle elsewhere except in Mark. There are details that Mark provides that seem strange or at least different. And that is that Jesus puts his fingers in the man's ears and that he touches the man's tongue and says that Aramaic word for be opened, ephaphatha, or something like that, and that the man is healed. This is reported only in Mark. And then there's another healing. Uh, if we have the place correctly uh, pinpointed, Beth said it would have been just on the other side of the Jordan River on the east side, across from the territory that was Galilee proper and, and Jewish. And there in that city, very near where Jesus lived in Capernaum, people brought a blind man to him for healing. And the details of this healing are different from other details of miracles. It says that Jesus spit on the man's eyes, and oddly, that's not the part that's so different. There's another time in John where he heals a blind person and he uh, spits on the dirt and makes the mud and puts it on the man's eyes. But it says he spits on the man's eyes, then he lays his hands on him, and he asks the man, does he see anything? Well, the man gives an ambiguous reply. Sorry for the misspelling there. He gives an ambiguous reply saying he sees people and they look like trees. Then only after Jesus lays hands on him again is he healed. So those two miracles and that 
unusual account of protecting Jesus from the crowds. And then there's one other very unusual story that occurs only in the Gospel of Mark. And that is in the 14th chapter, verses 50 through 52. It's particularly verses 51 and 52 that are unique to Mark. It is in the Garden of Gethsemane when Judas is betraying Jesus and handing him over to the officials. We're told that as Jesus is arrested and Jesus turns himself over, but uh, speaks boldly to those who are arresting him, that everybody else just runs away. Mark provides this intriguing detail. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him. But he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Such a strange story. You have to wonder why it's there. Well, in the first place, it's there to show the tension, uh, the, uh, the power plays and the fear in the Garden of Gethsemane. That some young man who, who tried to follow and see what's happening with Jesus, when they grabbed for him, he just let him have his, uh, his cloth that was covering him up and he just kept on running away and left his clothes behind. The story is so odd that with no real way to establish if it's true or not, many people have suggested maybe that's a detail Mark remembers. He was probably, Mark was probably younger than the apostles. Maybe Mark himself was there at the time. Uh, he did live in Jerusalem and maybe that's his own memory. But this is the only place that story shows up. Now we're moving to passages that are unique to the Gospel of Luke. Now Luke is the longest of the Synoptic Gospels, and we're going to look at it in, in sections of the Gospel of Luke. Uh, two sections in this presentation, and then we're going to add an additional presentation for the last uh, section. Um, other way around. One introductory section followed by a separate lecture on two other sections. Well, the beginning of Luke. Luke very clearly states his uh, purpose and his method in writing his Gospels. He says that he is compiling an additional narrative. He is aware that others have recorded uh, the story of Jesus, but up front he's only calling it things accomplished among us but he is compiling. And what he says he's doing is that he is putting in order carefully researched accounts from eyewitnesses. So he is making it clear that he was not an eyewitness, but that he has talked to eyewitnesses, that he has carefully researched these various accounts of things that happened. And he's writing to someone named Theophilus, probably an individual, but perhaps a generic, uh, term uh, personifying a lover of God, which is Theophilos, what it means. And he says that his purpose is to make Theophilus certain about what he's been taught. Beyond that, we have much more detail about the birth of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke than elsewhere. In fact, only Matthew gives any other details, but Matthew's has a different focus. Luke gives us details about the coming birth of Jesus. That is, it is prophesied, it is predicted. Two of the stories that he tells are about the angel Gabriel, but not what you would expect. Gabriel speaks to a priest named Zechariah, and he reveals to Zechariah that in his old age, he and his wife are going to have a special son born named John. And he saw that his son will be filled with the Holy Spirit and that that son will, in the spirit and power of Elijah, prepare people for the Lord. Then we read that Gabriel goes to the young woman Mary in her hometown of Nazareth. Zechariah being a priest would have been in Jerusalem. Gabriel reassures Mary that this birth that he is announcing to Mary, this virgin birth, 
is one that will come through the Holy Spirit. And then we have the account of Mary visiting Elizabeth, they're related, and both of them praise God for his blessings. Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit and she blesses Mary and her unborn child. We're even told that Elizabeth's baby jumps in her womb when the uh, pregnant Mary comes in. Uh, we need to add from the last slide that Mary responds by magnifying the Lord with uh, for the wonders that he has done for her, for, for the good things, the ways that he has blessed Mary. That's what we call the Magnificat. Moving on to chapter two of Luke. Luke provides much detail that helps us to put the story of Jesus into historical context. He actually dates the birth of Jesus. Of course, you know, they didn't use uh, AD and BC uh, at the time of Jesus. Uh, they dated things according to the year of the reign of, of whoever was in charge. We're told that he was born in the days of Caesar Augustus. And then we're given a detail about a Syrian government official named Quirinius, and that the, he is somehow associated with the census that uh, was ordered in the name of Caesar Augustus. We are aware of this Quirinius, whether he was a government official at what time, there's some question about that. But Luke provides a date in the, in the time of Caesar Augustus, and he tells us where Jesus is born. Now, Matthew mentions that it's in Bethlehem, but he doesn't explain how they got from or why they were not in their hometown of Nazareth in Galilee, but instead were in Bethlehem in Judea. Well, we're told that Joseph takes Mary from Nazareth to Bethlehem because of the census and that Mary gives birth and places her son in a manger. You're aware there was no room for them in the end. Let me make an apology again for my typographical errors. It should say that Joseph takes Mary from Nazareth to Bethlehem, Joseph. And then Jesus is born. Luke describes the glory of the birth of Jesus. He's the one who tells us about the angels who give a message to shepherds in the field, who send them to see Jesus in the manger. Their message is one that I'm sure you're quite familiar with. The angels tell the shepherds, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. The shepherds do visit and they spread the word glorifying God as they go. Only Luke describes the childhood of Jesus in a relatively long section of chapter two, beginning in verse 21 through the end of the chapter. The first thing we learn is that Jesus is presented at the temple, a ritual that would have been when a child was a few months old. And while at the temple, two older people, Simeon and Anna, who are at the temple, praise the baby Jesus and acknowledge him as the one that the Lord is sending. Then we're told that they return to the hometown, to the small town of Nazareth, where Jesus grows up. One side story that you probably know is that when Jesus is 12 years old, he is accompanying the family on a regular visit to uh, to a um, celebration in Jerusalem. And Jesus gets left behind. His, fam his parents, assuming he's with other family members. And Jesus stays there and he speaks with the teachers who are at the Jerusalem temple and amazes them. Of course, his parents come, they find him, scold him a little bit for making them worry, 
And then it says he goes back to Nazareth and he is subject to his parents. And a beautiful passage at the end of Luke chapter 2 says that Jesus increases in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. I've always thought that's a wonderful lesson for child rearing, for youth ministry, is to help young people to grow wise, to grow physically mature, to grow in God's favor, and to grow in people's favor. You grew up to be a fine young man in Nazareth. Still in the opening of Luke, but now in the adult life of Jesus, we see in the third chapter, we have another date from Luke. John the Baptist begins his ministry in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. He can't pin it down because the calendars have changed through the ages, but it is about A.D. 29 when John the Baptist starts his ministry. Also, we're told that it's in the time of Pontius Pilate as governor of Judea and Herod as Tetrarch of Galilee. There's more than one Herod in the New Testament. This one is Herod Antipas. So he was the one ruling Galilee and some other territories. Pontius Pilate was the governor in Judea. And we do have dates from outside the Bible that help us to pin down all of this is at the time around 29. Luke also provides some details about what John the Baptist said in his preaching that we don't find elsewhere. That is that people who have plenty, who have enough clothes and food, need to share with people who don't have them. He answers tax collectors who say, well, what kind of repentance do we need? And he says, you don't need to be collecting any more taxes than you're authorized to collect. He tells soldiers, again, I apologize for my typing. He tells soldiers that they don't need to be uh, pushing people around, uh, abusing their authority. They need to be content with their wages and not try to get stuff out of other people by force. And then Luke only gives details that follow about the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. Only Luke tells us that Jesus is about 30 when he begins his ministry, which dovetails very handily with the year 29, since we date the years from the birth of Christ. The genealogy that Luke provides for Jesus is different from the, Luke, uh, the uh, genealogy that Matthew provides, particularly from the time of King David up until the time of Jesus. There are distinct differences. And the uh, turning point seems to be that in Luke's genealogy, it is traced through a son of David named Nathan. And in Matthew, it is traced through the son who inherited the throne, Solomon. Solomon and Nathan were both children of Bathsheba. It sounds like a contradiction but if you've done any genealogy, you'll see that eventually the lines diverge and the lines come together. And when you're talking about the Jewish people who kept close records of their ancestry and who treasured staying within the tribe, then it would be fully expected that Joseph and Mary would have common ancestors with Mary coming off one branch of the family and Joseph off the others. And that seems to be the most common explanation for this difference between the two. As it is in Matthew's account of the genealogy and ancestry, Luke presents Jesus as a descendant of David and Abraham, but that's as far back as Matthew goes. Luke, goes all the way back to Adam, and Adam being created by God is called here the Son of God. So we have something of a closure of a section, bookends. We started out uh, 
reading about in Mark, uh, Jesus, the son of God, uh, Mary being told that her child would be son of the most high. And now we find out that his ancestry goes all the way back to Adam, whom God created the son of God. In a different sense, of course, than Jesus is the son of God. One significance of this difference is that Luke, who seems to be of a broader background than just Palestine, seems to be writing for people beyond Palestine. And so he goes back to the ancestor of all people, not just the ancestors of the Jews. There are some unique details and the events that Luke chronicles about the ministry of Jesus while he was based in Galilee. He presents a time when Jesus makes an outright claim to fulfill the promises of God. It happens in his childhood home of Nazareth, even though as an adult, he's living down the road in Capernaum. But Nazareth ends up rejecting him. So as he's traveling, Jesus comes to his childhood home and he goes into the synagogue and he reads the scripture, which comes from Isaiah. It's all about um, God bringing delivery to those who need rescue and delivery. But when he finishes it, he says, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now we're told that although people marvel at his words, Jesus is aware that they're about to reject him. Some of them are saying, you know this guy, this, he grew up here. This is just Joseph's son. Jesus, obviously knowing their attitude about his miracles, uh, calls them on their attitude. He says that the people back home disrespect him because he's not doing miracles there. Well, there is that famous saying that a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown, among his own people. And we do know from elsewhere in the Gospels that Jesus didn't do miracles there because people didn't believe in him there. And so he exposes their evidently unspoken to him resentment of him and rejection of him. And he reminds them that Elijah and Elisha, the famous early prophets who did miracles, that they did miracles uh, for outsiders. Uh, they, um, for instance, uh, blessed a woman in Zarephath up towards Tyre and Sidon, uh, did a miracle for Naaman, uh, the leper, uh, who was not at all a Jew. Well, when Jesus calls them on their disbelief, they get so angry that they want to throw him off a cliff, but he manages to get away. Luke provides a detail about the calling of Peter, James, and John to follow him. When he calls them to be fishers of men or, or to tell them they can catch people now instead of fish, in calling them to, to spread the gospel. He uses this idea of fishing with a connection to a miracle. He is there by the Sea of Galilee, or, or the Sea of Gennesaret, it's also called, and he sees them coming in. They haven't caught a thing. And he uh, asks Peter to let him get in the boat, and he comes out, and then he tells Peter to put out into the into the sea and to throw the net on a certain side. And, uh, and he says, look, we, we've been fishing all night. We didn't catch anything. Well, when they do what Jesus says, they start pulling in so many fish, it's about to sink the boat. And at that time, he calls Peter, James, and John, who've seen the miracle, and tells them that they will become fishers of men. There is an interesting alternate lesson that Jesus preaches very similar to what we read in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. Uh, 
he pronounces blessings or beatitudes on people very similar to those that we read in his sermon recorded in Matthew chapter five. Similar, but not the same. In the sermon that Luke presents, Jesus pronounces his blessings on the poor, where Matthew records a sermon where he talks about the poor in spirit. And Luke tells about Jesus pronouncing blessings on the hungry, where Matthew talks about those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They do both talk about those who are weeping, about those who've been rejected. What is even more strikingly different in this sermon than the Sermon on the Mount is that these uh, blessings, these beatitudes, are followed by curses. That is, Jesus pronounces woes on people who are in the opposite condition. Those who are rich, those who are full, those who are laughing, and who are among those respected by people. The difference between the two groups is on whether you're going to get your reward now, as in human accolades, or later, when God gives it in eternity. A little more on details that Luke provides to stories that occur in the other Gospels as well. There is a, a miracle. Uh, in fact, it, it's, um, it's not recorded in the other Gospels. Jesus is traveling and goes through a evidently small town named Nain, and there's a funeral procession. The widow is grieving for her dead son. It would have been a, a terrible situation. Uh, remember, women had no economic power. Her husband was dead, and now her son that could have supported her is dead. We're told that Jesus, out of compassion, touches the, um, we would call it the casket, and the man rises up and is alive and speaks. It's particularly interesting that in this case, we're told that Jesus responds out of compassion. There's another story in the seventh chapter of Luke that is not in the other gospels, although there is one quite similar to it. And that is when Jesus forgives a woman who washes his feet with her tears. He has been called to a dinner at a Pharisee's home. And while he's there, there's a woman who's washing his feet with her tears and drying them with her hair. And the people at the dinner object, Jesus should know that this woman is a sinner. But Jesus says, she's the one who's been hospitable to me, not the host. And he goes on to give them a parable and teach them that the one who is forgiven much loves much. And then he goes so far as to tell the woman her sins are forgiven because of her great faith. And that shocks the people at the Pharisees' dinner. How dare Jesus tell someone she's forgiven? Can Jesus forgive sins? And then in Luke chapter 8, the first three verses, we have an account only from Luke about the women who accompanied him in his traveling and preaching. There are women in the group of this traveling ministry, and they are identified to at least include women who had been freed of demons, and three are named, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Susanna. And we're told that these women provided for the traveling disciples out of their means. Evidently, these were all women of means who could help pay the expenses of Jesus and his apostles as they traveled, spreading the word. In a separate lecture, we're going to pick up on the part of Luke that is most significantly uh, unique 
there's much that Luke gives in chapters 9 through about 20 when Jesus is traveling for the last time to Jerusalem. Luke gives us a wealth of information about things that he said and did on that last trip to Jerusalem before he is arrested, crucified, buried, and raised from the dead. But that for the next lecture, and, um, and that'll be it for this one.